gonna be honest, my camera's ISO is very high. I have no idea what that's gonna do to this at all. Hi, I'm Morgan and welcome to my channel. So today's video is about 10 books that haunt me. It's less dramatic than it sounds. So by that I mean books that I still think about, books that have stayed with me since I've read them, um, most of them quite a few years ago and they're not necessarily my favourites but they have stuck with me in some way and kind of shaped how I've read and how I still read to this day. However, some of them are my favourites, in fact, I think most of them would be on an extended favourites list, but anyway. <laughs> so this isn't a ranked list, but I'm going to talk about them in a kind of vague order and it'll be in an order of kind of when I read them. So starting with ones that I read in primary school and then getting up to ones that I've read recently. So the first book I'm going to talk about is My Sister Jodie by Jacqueline Wilson. I have talked about Jacqueline Wilson like several times and I only have like three videos up at this point but she was my fave and also she came out she's a queen we're here for it so this is about two sisters whose parents get jobs working at a boarding school and they all have to move there as a family and that's where the girls go to school now and it's kind of a lot about their relationship and how the sisters relate to each other. The main character and protagonist um, looks up to her older sister Jodie and is kind of trying to figure out her own place in the world while still having this relationship with her sister and her parents and going through this move where she's like, everything feels wild um, because it is a book for children. So I must have read it when I was, I don't know, maybe eight or nine. This is a children's book for kids who will love gothic literature. <laughs> um, I am a big fan of gothic literature, um, specifically Victorian gothic. It's something that I found I actually really like. And I think that this was kind of an introduction for me. Um, it's very atmospheric. Some of Jacqueline Wilson's books are like that, which is kind of surprising. Like it's not what you'd expect for a kid's book. Um, but I remember being enraptured by this like, big gothic castle and like the spooky things that the sister was like oh what is happening? Did I want to be Jodie? Yes. Was I definitely more of a peril? Also yes. As is typical of a Jacqueline Wilson book it's uh, mostly just about peril trying to understand herself and find herself in this world that she's not used to but also about her relationship with her sister. Uh, familiar relationships are really important in a lot of her books and specifically in here and I'm just going to say spoilers, you probably won't read it, but spoilers, um, Jodie dies at the end and that was like the first time I'd read a twist that like stuck with me. It's a twist that I still think about to this day, like if I was to go back and give you an example of something that I was like shocked by as a young child, it would be Jodie dying in My Sister Jodie. The next book I'm going to talk about is my Name is Mina by David Almond. Almond? Almond? I don't know. I, I, I can't say it. This is another one that I read in primary school, probably when I was about 11. This is the prequel to a book called Skellig by David Almond, um, which is about a man with wings who might be an angel, might not be. It was a very weird book. I studied that in primary school, probably about primary five or six and I really enjoyed it and when I found out that there was a prequel I was like yes I want to read this specifically because this is about a character called Mina who I really liked when I read Skellig and why this has stuck with me for so many years is because of how it uses form. So this is technically supposed to be Mina's journal. It helps you understand her more because you kind of see what's going on in her head. So there's a lot of pages like this I have no idea if you can see this very well. Um, the font changes, the colour changes. When I was 11 I thought that was amazing <laughs> and to this day I am a big fan of like mixed media and playing with the form. I think it's really interesting. I think it can really help portray feelings and emotions and help us really truly understand characters which is um, a big thing for me. So I love character driven books and that's why I love this so much. And overall just the story of a quirky little girl who doesn't feel like she fits in and feels kind of outside of everything else in the world. 
I definitely felt like that was me when I was a child and it is something that has stuck with me to this day which is why I still have my copy. <laughs> So the next book I'm going to talk about is A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. Now Patrick Ness is one of my favourite authors. I met him when I was like 16 at the Edinburgh Book Festival and I cried as I walked away. My, like my friends took a video of me and I was just like... <sighs> and this is actually one of the books that I got signed because it's one of my favourites. So A Monster Calls is about a young boy whose mother is pretty much dying of cancer and he knows that and he doesn't know how to deal with it so he ends up talking to this mystical magical fantasy creature who is the titular monster and it helps him deal with the life that he is stuck with. I read A Monster Calls in one sitting while travelling back from a caravan holiday in the Lake District and I cried so much. By the time we got back to Glasgow I was sobbing in the back of my dad's car and my family were just like are you are you okay? I think that this is such a great exploration of grief instead of delving into those feelings which can be really hard for a child or a young person to comprehend it does it through metaphor through the existence of the monster and the stories that the monster tells. The fantasy elements truly allow for a more metaphorical exploration of the feelings that Connor is having and the situation that he is finding himself in. One that he himself doesn't really understand. So putting it down in words and emotions would perhaps not be the best way to show it. And honestly, putting it through this fantasy lens really helps articulate how hard it is to articulate these things, how hard it is to talk about grief, especially a grief that you know is coming, not one that's happening to you, one you're having to prepare for. And I think that what stuck with me the most is showing emotions instead of telling them, because I can find it really hard myself to put my emotions down in words, and I think metaphors are what truly help you understand. The next book I'm going to talk about is actually a play and it is Macbeth by William Shakespeare. This was the first Shakespeare play that I read and enjoyed. I read this in high school and at that age classics and renaissance and plays like these can be really hard to understand. It can just sound like complete gobbledygook and you don't care because you don't understand and you don't relate to it and it's just boring. But the way I studied it in my fourth year English class made it really interesting to me and I've actually read it a couple more times because it's probably my favourite Shakespeare play, if not just my favourite Shakespeare tragedy. The drama, the revenge, the functional female characters, what else could I ask for? And I don't really have much to say about this, just that I am haunted by every line that Lady Macbeth says. She's such a powerful character who knows what she wants and she goes after it but also she is flawed in the end. We do see her fall apart and honestly I think that's what I love so much about it. The next book I'm going to talk about is The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. This is another book that plays with form and indeed the role of the narrator. This tells the story of a young girl living in Nazi Germany in the Second World War. It tells the story of her life and the lives of the people around her as war truly sets in. This is another one that pulls at your heartstrings. Again, death is a big focus. I don't know why I'm like this, but here we are. I love the relationship between the main character and um, her best friend Liz Lizelle and Rudy. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. We're not... We're not getting into that again. I love how their relationship is about first love and the exploration of losing someone for the first time that you don't expect to lose. I love the character of Death as the narrator of the story, as the narrator of Lizelle's story. When I read it for the first time I was like, oh my goodness, this is groundbreaking, revolutionary. Obviously the actual plot is really great and that's why it's one of my favourite books, but I think what stuck with me from this was truly how it was written, having that 
third person omniscient narrator as an actual person, as using the, the first person pronouns but it is an omniscient narrator. The next three that I'm going to talk about are pretty much interchangeable when it comes to the timeline of when I read them. I read all of these for my advanced higher English class in sixth year. I did two for my dissertation and one I studied with my class. So the two I did for my dissertation I'm going to talk about kind of together because they are now just linked in my head. Whenever I think about one I automatically think about the other. And they are The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath and The Trick is to Keep Breathing by Janice Galloway. The Bell Jar is a book that I think you get the most out of reading for the first time when you're a teenager, specifically for girls, because a lot of what Sylvia Plath um, talks about and touches upon are things that girls feel at that age and it kind of looks at the uncertainty of your life and the world and trying to figure out where you fit in. And honestly I think it did come at a great time for me. It came at a time where I was like, oh my goodness, it's like she's inside of my brain. I was dealing with my own mental health issues at the time and I felt like the main character was really, really relatable. It's also got Sylvia Plath's poetic way of writing um, and her very metaphorical and poetic way of looking at things and articulating herself. I think that's kind of a theme here. It's something that I really enjoy because I think that just explaining how you feel or how your character feels doesn't always give you the depth of emotion. Which is why I guess metaphor is such a great thing. And in the bell jar there is the famous passage about the fig tree which I think is relatable for everyone who has no idea what they're doing with their life. And also the recurring motif of the bell jar itself truly helps us understand how the main character feels when she's in the world. She feels like she is living under this bell jar and it's stopping her from living the life she wants to. The Trick is to Keep Breathing is another book about grief. Shocker, I know. And it also talks about mental health and it has a Scottish setting and a Scottish author which makes it all the more enjoyable for me. It is another book that plays with its form. It lacks typical chapter breaks and it has sections that are written like um, a script or a list and these sections reflect how the main character Joy is processing the world after the death of her significant other. Now both of these books deal with different overall issues but they focus on the mental health of their main female character and how that shapes their interactions with the world around them. Both are beautifully written and relatable and will always just have one space together in my mind. So the next book is one that I studied in high school and it is Tess of the Dubervilles by Thomas Hardy. Durbervilles? Dubervilles. Durbervilles? I can't pronounce anything. Now, I don't know if this is the first classic I ever enjoyed, but it's definitely the first one that I had a lot of passionate opinions about. Basically, Tess deserved so much better and I will fight every single man in her life. It's a sprawling tale that follows Tess over her life and through all of the beautiful and traumatic events that she goes through. I think this was the first time I'd read something that was so widely spread over a life and I think that's what really interested me. I got to see how all of the events of her life built on top of each other to bring her to her end. It's also just full of lots of imagery and recurring motifs which I am a huge fan of, in case you couldn't tell. And Tess is just an angel who deserves so much so she herself will haunt me for the rest of my life. Okay, hear me out, it's another book about grief. <laughs> but I think this is um, a quite different book from the ones that I've talked about and it is Grief is the Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. This is a very short book and it's about two boys and their father who are plagued by a crow after the death of the wife and mother. And the crow itself is basically the manifestation of their grief. I recently read uh, Max Porter's second book, which is slightly bigger than this one, and he does a lot of similar things in that, which I really, really enjoyed because he lets the reader 
make their own decisions. He lets the reader pick at what he's written to truly understand what's going on. He leaves it to us to read into the subtext and lets the metaphor speak for itself. I loved the mix of verse and prose and overall the just the poetic nature of the book. It was the first time I'd actually read something in verse that wasn't just like a traditional old-fashioned poem. Not that there's anything wrong with old-fashioned poetry, I've just found that I enjoy stuff that's more free verse and experimental, which is why I really like this. And the last book I'm going to talk about is Station Eleven by Emily St John Mandel. This is an apocalyptic novel, my fave kind, we be new. What I love most about this is that it's an exploration of character. It's about the bonds people form, the ones that they stick to and the ones that they don't. The choices that people make while trying to survive in a world that is completely different from the one we understand now. But they're still holding on to our way of understanding each other and society. We see this in all the little towns that show up throughout the book, we see this in the people that stay in the airport, and we see it mostly in the travelling symphony themselves, who have chosen to continue to share art with the world, who are looking to try and preserve this art and to keep it alive. I would say it's a very quiet apocalypse novel. There isn't a big showy climax at the end where everything crashes together and there's lots of fighting and dying as you usually expect in apocalyptic books. Station Eleven comes to its conclusion slowly and then life moves on. You've probably guessed already that I do love character driven books. I love delving into relationships and why people stay together even if they don't particularly like each other. I think this is the perfect example of what I like in apocalyptic fiction, which is just focusing on people and how they adapt to the situation that is thrown at them. What haunts me the most about this is the thing that actually made me read it in the first place. There is a Star Trek quote near the beginning of the novel that is written on the side of the Travelling Symphony's trailer. The quote is, survival is insufficient. And that is exactly how I want to live and look at the world and also what I love about these kind of books because just living isn't worth it. Just battling the zombies or surviving the virus, those things are all super interesting. But what comes after? What do you do when you have to rebuild when all you're left with is each other? And that is my list of 10 books that haunt me. If you've read these, let me know what you think about them and also let me know if you have any books that haunt you. Um, I love learning about these sorts of things because I think it tells you a lot about a person and as we've established, I like to understand people. <laughs> if you've made it to the end, thank you very much for watching. It would be great if you could like, comment, subscribe, come talk to me in one of my other social medias which are all linked down, down here somewhere. I don't know, I'm playing with my lenses again. But I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Thanks for watching. Bye.